Welcome to Words of Hope. We're so delighted that you've joined us again. This series of short but important messages has been put together by the Elam Church in Ireland with the purpose of speaking life into this current situation that we find ourselves in. If you have missed any of them up to now, they've been running every Sunday night in May, then please do look back on our Facebook page, go to our YouTube channel, and you'll be able to catch up on both the talks and the Q&As that followed. We'd love you also to take a moment to share this on your Facebook page and invite friends and family to watch and maybe people who would benefit from the message that's going to be shared. And also if you're an administrator on your church page then we'd love for you to share it on that too. Tonight it's my pleasure to introduce Charlotte Curran. Charlotte is a teacher, a speaker, an author and an incredible communicator and tonight she'll be talking about fear in lockdown. After her talk we'd love you to hang around and to stay tuned for the Q&A which gives us an opportunity to delve a little bit deeper and to try and understand a little bit more about the topics that she discusses in her talk. But for now here's Charlotte talking about fear in lockdown. Tonight we're asking the question how do we handle fear? Because in the current climate Fear is just rife and it can be so difficult to know what to do when we're afraid. And if that's the way you feel right now, I totally empathise with you. There was a season in my life where fear had done so much damage to me that I was actually at a stage where I was afraid to leave my home. Just really basic, simple things like that had me terrified. And I am through the other side of that. So I want to say to you today that if you are struggling with fear, there is life on the other side of this and that fear doesn't have to ha have the last word and actually there's a way through this. So I want to give you some advice that I've, I've learnt on how to handle fear and how to make your way through to the other side. And I want to do that through a guy in the Bible called Elijah who was very afraid. And Elijah is a bit of a legend in case you don't know who he is. He's, um, he's a cool kid. He is gutsy and courageous and he lived at a time where the monarchy uh, was really, they were a dodgy lot and there was a lot of darkness in them, a lot of control, they weren't good people and the queen of the time particularly, she was into a form of worship called Baal worship and she's kind of encouraging the whole country to follow her into that and just to give you an indication of how dark that was, one of the practices in Baal worship was this practice of sacrificing your children in the fire to Baal and she was kind of pushing this practice and it was becoming quite commonplace this worship of Baal in the nation and Elijah even though the king and queen are hugely powerful and quite dangerous and violent people Elijah's not afraid of them and oftentimes we see him having these standoffs against uh, this monarchy because he doesn't want to see the country go this way and so he's had many standoffs with them and then there's this one day where he has this particular standoff with them that goes really well actually and public opinion is starting to sway away from Baal worship and back to worship of the one true God which is really good news for the country but as a result of this the queen Jezebel she is infuriated and she um, makes a death threat over Elijah and basically says within 24 hours you're a dead man and because she's so powerful she can actually make this happen and in 1 Kings 19 verse 3 we hear uh, Elijah is afraid so that's a phrase that's used and as a result of this fear he kind of runs off into the desert to, to try and find God and find his way through this moment that he's in and as we watch him journey we get some really good advice on how to handle fear and one of the first things we see is when God meets him in this place of fear the first thing that God does is he lets him have a nap and then he wakes him and he feeds him then he lets him have another nap and he wakes him and he feeds him again which sounds totally bizarre but it's such good advice because sometimes we think that our mental health, our emotional health, our physical health, our spiritual health, they're all these different pots and they don't affect each other but actually as human beings we're more like a set of pipelines than pots and pressure in one part of the system will show itself in another part of the system. So for example you may have in your history had a headache which is a physical health issue but maybe it was caused because you were under mental pressure. It's because we're a pipeline and sometimes when we're afraid we think oh that's a mental health issue or maybe it's an emotional health issue or maybe it's even a spiritual health issue and we forget that our physical health 
affects all of those things. And so when you're afraid, one of the first things and one of the easiest things to test is how is your physical health? because that can be affecting the level of your fear. You know, are you going to bed at a sensible time? Are you having exercise, which really, really helps with anxiety and fear? Um, what are you putting in your body? Because when you're afraid, it's really tempting to go for, you know, sugar and comfort foods and caffeine and actually putting a lot of sugar in your body, a lot of caffeine in your body, a lot of alcohol in your body, that's not gonna help with your levels of anxiety. And so the first piece of advice I would give you was take a look at your physical health. But the next thing that God does is he has this conversation with Elijah and in the middle of it, Elijah makes this statement where he says, God, the problem is uh, they've killed everybody like me. I'm the only one left. That's an interesting statement because the king and queen have been killing off people like Elijah one by one, but Elijah's not the only one left. In fact, there are a hundred other people just like him that he knows about that have been hidden from the king and queen. And so when Elijah makes a statement, I'm the only one left, it's an exaggerated statement and it shows us what happens when we're afraid. When we are afraid, we fall into the trap of exaggerated thinking, which is, you know, you might have seen it in your own life when at night time you go to bed and you have this, the problem is this size, this is the, the problem, the facts of the problem, the difficulty is this size. But then as you lie awake and you think about it, you begin to exaggerate the problem by adding all the possibilities well, maybe though then this will happen and maybe then this will happen and maybe then this will happen. And the problem grows and grows and grows by this kind of thinking known as worst case scenario thinking. And when we're afraid that can happen. And what happens when we do that is fear, whenever the problem is this size, fear only has this amount of space to run in in our minds. But as we add all of those other possibilities on and we start to think about them and think about them and think about them, we extend the ground of our mind in which fear can run. And all of a sudden fear is running rampant on the inside of us. And what we need to do instead is we need to narrow the field down for fear to run in right back down to the facts. What are the facts? And stop thinking about all the possibilities in the worst case scenarios because that will debilitate us and the bible talks about taking captive every thought which means as the thoughts come into our mind we need to catch them we need to examine them and say is this a fact or is this just a possibility that might happen and if it's a possibility we don't need to dwell on that instead we need to think about some really beautiful truths that we know and when we think about beautiful truths that we know, that will narrow down the field in which fear can run. And that will be super helpful for us in handling and managing our way through fear. And the last piece of advice I want to give you from the life of Elijah is simply this. When Elijah was afraid, he ran to God. And that's really super good advice. And honestly, that has been the thing that has helped me more than anything else. It kind of reminds me of one of the first films I ever saw in the cinema, which was The Lion King many years ago. And there's this scene in The Lion King where this little lion cub, he comes up against these hyenas who are much bigger, much stronger than him. And he's trapped and so he roars at them. But the roar, because he's a lion cub, is so minuscule that it has no effect. And the hyenas all laugh at him and say, go on, roar again. But the next time he roars, it's this massive loud roar and the hyenas are kind of, they're shocked and stunned. But it's not because the cub's roaring. It's because this big daddy lion, his dad has come behind him and he's roaring. And the hyenas might mess with the cub, but they are not messing with the dad. And there's something in this about running to God. You see, your problem might be bigger than you. And actually your fear might be much bigger than you and, and you can't handle it on your own. But when we run to God, when we call out to him for help, he comes to our rescue and he is much bigger than any problem you or I will ever face. And he is much bigger than fear. And he begins to roar on our behalf. And so I just want to say to you, you see, if you're afraid, you don't need to handle this on your own. Because there is a God who cares very deeply about you. This big, massive God who wants to come to your rescue. But he won't come unless you call. You know, he's not going to push his way and bully his way into your life. We need to invite him. And so the best advice, honestly, that I can give you is this. When you're afraid, invite God into the middle of that fear to help you. Because you don't have to do this on your own. He is for you and he wants to walk you through fear to the other side. Thanks to Charlotte for her message. If you're journeying towards faith, if you have further questions, if you'd like to speak to someone about Jesus and how he can make a difference in your life, then we would love for you to get in touch with us. 
You can email us at info at elamchurchireland.com. You can also uh, have a look at the further resources that are available on www.elamchurchireland.com forward slash words of hope. The links will be in the description. It's also my privilege to say that Words of Hope is taking on a new form, but it will continue in the month of June. It will be on Monday nights at 8 p.m. and it's taking on a slightly different look. It's going to be called Words of Hope Mental Health Conversations, where there will be mental health professionals, pastors and people who have journeyed through certain things will be discussing and looking at certain issues pertaining to mental health. We would love for you to tune in and for you to share and for you to connect with that. Next week on the 8th of June, we'll be talking about stress and how stress impacts our mental health. If you have any questions that you would like answered by our panel, we would love you to get in touch. Again, email us at the same email info at elamchurchireland.com or Simply put a message through Messenger on Facebook or our social media platforms and we will do our best uh, to include as many of those questions in the Q&A as possible. So that's next Monday from 8pm. Well thank you so much for joining us and we really do hope that you can hang around for the Q&A so that we can delve a little bit deeper into this topic fear and lockdown. God bless. So thank you, Charlotte, for your talk. Um, I'm sure that so many people have found that not just practical, but really helpful. And really in this Q&A, what we hope to do is give an opportunity to delve a little bit deeper into the subject of fear and even uh, to, to touch a little bit on mental health. We're also joined by Pastor Davy Beckett. So let's uh, just take a moment and have the guys introduce themselves. So I'm Charlotte and um, I'm married to Drew. I have two boys, Caden, who is 11, and Eli, who is nine. And um, I am a teaching and discipleship pastor at CFC Church in Belfast. I'm Gibby Beggett. I'm a pastor in Bangorean Church, I'm married to Fiona. I have three boys, Peter, Timothy and Stephen, three beautiful uh, daughter-in-laws, one to be a daughter-in-law actually, and then three fantastic grandkids and a grand dog. And I've been in I've been in Bangreenham thirty two years as a pastor there. Brilliant, Davy and Charlotte. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, guys, for taking the time to join us and to put yourselves in the hot seat and answer some questions. We really do appreciate that, and we do believe that it will be of help because there will be some people, whether it's people of faith or people who are on a journey towards faith, who will be struggling with some of the issues that we're about to talk about, and we really want to provide them with some help. Um, Charlotte, first of all, in your talk, you alluded to some struggles that you have journeyed through. Uh, would you be up for sharing some of your story with us? Yeah, for sure. So uh, in the talk, we were talking about fear and anxiety. And I suppose really my journey with fear and anxiety has been an extremely long one. Whenever I look back now at my childhood, I can see that I was probably unnaturally afraid of a lot of things that other kids wouldn't even have thought about, you know, like things like when we were walking around the shop, I would have been adding up everything that my mom was putting in the basket because I was terrified she wouldn't have enough money, even though that never happened. I, I was just afraid of everything. And, and so that kind of became the atmosphere of my life, I suppose. And, and I realize now looking back that what happened really was um, fear became this voice that I became really accustomed to. It became one that I started to trust. And the thing about fear is, and that, that kind of voice and the thoughts around fear is, fear sounds like your friend because it sounds like it's trying to protect you from things. So, you know, I would have had a lot of thoughts like, oh, don't try that, you might fail. Or don't go there, something bad might happen. Or don't do this, something like this. And so you began to think that, that these thoughts were protective thoughts and really good, helpful thoughts. And so even though I was a Christian from I was a little girl, I realize now looking back that the voice of God directing me became much quieter in my own mind than this voice of fear. And actually fear became the dictatorial voice in my life. And I started to obey whatever fear said to me. And, and I thought that it was my friend. And really what happened was... I, it was hemming me in little by little and taking more and more of my life. And the more that I gave to it, the more that it took. And I remember getting to this moment in my life where in my early twenties, I wasn't long married. 
I had got to the stage where I was afraid the vast majority of the day. I couldn't sleep at night. I would wake up, you know, screaming sometimes. I would, my heart would be racing. I wouldn't be able to eat. I would maybe have a wee window of time between about half five and half six at night where I felt okay. And apart from that, I just struggled the whole time with this paralyzing fear. And yet it had become my normal. I just thought this is just the way life is. This is just my personality. This is just who I am. So I know other people aren't like this but this is just who I am and then there was this one day where my sister who I love phoned and said do you want to come around to our house for you know tea or something and I loved her house like it was my favorite place in the world to be and yet I was terrified to go and that was my moment sounds so small but that was my wake-up moment where I was like hold on a minute this cannot be normal and this cannot be okay actually I can't live like this and I suppose I got a moment where I glimpsed into my future and thought what happens if I keep giving more to fear? Like, where does this end up? Where does this road lead? And that became my pivot point. And really that started my journey of not accepting that had to be my story. And my journey to recovery really came from that point. So that was my story. Wow. Wow. Thank you for sharing. Um, and Davey, um, yeah. you've journeyed a bit of this road as well. You know, would you be happy enough just to tell the folks a little bit about your journey? 100%. Uh, it's about, I was trying to work it out how long ago was what really happened to me uh, about 10 years ago almost because I remembered from a granddaughter being born. And uh, really it was a whole list of things with being just pressure and being in the ministry. People people can be a pain, as you know. Uh, they can be a blessing, but they can be a pain. And it was a lot of stress, a lot of hassle. And uh, being a bloke, I didn't know where to turn or who to go to. And I knew there was signs, like Charlotte had said in her talk, you know, I wasn't sleeping, I wasn't eating properly. I liked the train and stuff, and it was even going by the way. So things were going bad if you, in my life, in a way. But I didn't really know what to do. I really didn't. And I, I wouldn't admit to it. That's the thing for me. I wouldn't admit that I was under pressure. So I kept saying yes to everything as usual. And as a pastor, you'll know that yourself. You, you say yes when you really should say no. But I, I just kept going. And I remember the day, right down to the, the second when it happened. And I explained it to people. It was like an elastic band snapped in my head. It was the pressure that came and came. It was like times when I was coming up to preach in the church. And I was so anxious. Like, And that's not me. I'm a people person. I like to be with people. But I, I couldn't face people, but I had to. So I forced my way and kept going. But I remember going to watch. I was, I was with my dad. We wanted to see the Blues and the Glens. And anybody who knows me knows that I love sport and I love football. And uh, I went to the match and I was sitting in the stand and I thought, I said to my dad, I need to get out of here. And I thought, there's something wrong with me here. Now the clans were running 2-0, so that made me depressed to start with. But I was really under pressure. And uh, I just sat there in this, as Charlotte has said there, a fear that was sort of, you can't explain it unless you've experienced it. And uh, the Blues actually came back and scored three, and we're winning one, three, two. And most of that would be I'd be hugging people and kissing people and high fiving, and I just wanted out of there. I remember driving home straight in. I don't even know how I drove home, going up in the bedroom, and I didn't come out of my bed for days, for days. I just wanted to hide, and that fear of hearing the bell ring, hearing the doorbell, even with my family coming, it was so tangible. It was real. It was like a dark hole, and uh, I've had other sicknesses in my life, but nothing as bad as that it was it wasn't just a. some people think they're depressed when they're down and up getting the blues or having a bad day but that was something else this was really a time where i was afraid of my own shadow it really was and that's not me and that that's where i, I really and in that then i had to seek help and hopefully i'll be able to help others so i, I can come from it not just as someone who can sympathize, but I can empathize. I know the stages, I know where people are coming from. And I think it, that has helped me to help other people and hopefully I'll be able to help people even tonight as we discuss. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. And even as you have said there, Davey, like a really thank you for your openness, Charlotte and Davey, because there will be people who'll be watching and they'll just be saying, that's me, that's where I'm at, or I'm on the road to that. And yeah. what they're listening to is two guys who have walked that road not two theorists, but two guys who have walked it. And um, we know that that makes a big difference whenever we're communicating to people. So thank you so much for that. Um, simple question, but maybe not simple answer. What what helped you guys get through? To be honest, it, it, it was a long process and it was a lot of different things for me. There was, uh, it was 
I suppose I was all I was praying. My first port of call was a call on God, and to be honest, I, it sounded as if he, he wasn't listening to me because I was stuck in this hole. And I'm thinking, why am I here? Of a church, I've got family, I've got all these things to do, and why is this happening to me? And that was my first port of call. And I honestly, I was at such a stage I couldn't do much for myself. But in my prayer, I would have a wee room where I'm in now, and I would go in here, and to be honest, I would have cried and just cried to God, help me. And I didn't think anything was happening, I really didn't. But unbeknown to me, and I suppose looking back, it's hindsight, God was actually opening up doors through medical people, through people that came in contact with. As I said, some people were so helpful to me, and they were God ordained. I went to, I attended the PNU units in Ards, and the, the folks that are there are not allowed to talk about Christianity, but God had set up a girl, two, a girl and then a guy from Africa, and they both opened up and they were Christians. So everything was sort of happening, but at the time I didn't think of it. So it was through medic, medicine, through miracles, through good counsel, and that's why I said, some people talk to you, and you're better being deaf, to be honest, and not listen to them. There's the people that say, pull yourself together, you need a good kick up the backside. All this rhetoric, and you can't even find yourself. But I think it was coming to God in my prayer, thinking nothing's happening. We're just singing tonight that the Waymaker, even when you think nothing's happening, God was working, and God was opening up the avenues and bringing people into my life that were helping me. That was the start of it. Um, I would say for me, key, like, like you, Davey, there's so many things like you get, there's, it's not one thing. And also I would say recovery from something like this is not linear. It's not like it always goes up. There are, there have been times where it goes up and down and up and down, up and down. And you kind of wiggle your way out of it, you know, little by little. But I would say for me, there had to come a pivot point because mine was so prolonged, my, my journey with anxiety and fear, because it had been decades uh, and it had been so subtle. There had to come for me a point where I said enough is enough. Like I actually, there has to be something better than this. And I had to really want something better because actually journeying out of prolonged fear and anxiety is a hard road and it takes effort and it takes some energy and it, it is hard work. And so there had to come a point where I just thought, I can't, I can't, this cannot be my life. There, I needed a pivot point. And then at that pivot point, I remember thinking, I don't know what to do here. Like now that I've got this pivot point, what on earth I do? And I did the only thing I knew to do. I phoned our pastor, which is why you guys always get phoned. I phoned our pastor. He at the time was Edwin Michael, and he had been my youth pastor growing up, and I really trusted him. And Drew and I, we were married at the time. I phoned him, he came around. And you know what? It's not like he had answers, but he sat and he listened and he cared, and he didn't make me feel like an idiot for feeling the way that I felt. And I would just say also to people like pastors, counsellors, trusted friends who sit with people who have anxiety and feel like I don't know how to help see your presence in that moment you don't understand how important that is and how valuable that is and Edwin sitting that day and just allowing me to speak and validating what I had to say that was massively helpful for me so I would say having trusted people because he was the first of many that I then invited into the journey trusted people to walk alongside you to pray for you when you can't even pray for yourself and you don't even have words and I would say another thing that's been really pivotal in my journey is a truth. Truth has been a key for me because a lot of my fear and anxiety was just built on pure downright lies that I had believed over the years. And so I had to go through a very long process of examining mindsets and rejecting anything that I had believed that was a lie and rebuilding foundations of truth in my life. And I would say those two things probably have been very key for me in my journey alongside lots of other stuff too, but they've been key in my journey back out of anxiety. Yeah. Brilliant, guys. Thank you so much. And of course, there's so much in there that time doesn't allow us to really unpack some of it. What I would love us to do is to go back to your talk, Charlotte. In your talk, you uh, I love the illustration that you said many of us view ourselves as pots, um, but actually we're more like a pipeline. Could you explain that a little bit further and help those who are listening maybe understand how we're so interconnected? Yeah, I think there's a human tendency to try to compartmentalize something that's connected and it's daft, but we don't realize it's daft. So for example, if you came here tonight to this Zoom call with a cup and there was very clearly a hole in the left hand side of the cup and you said, oh no, it's fine. Sure, the right hand side of the cup's grand. I'd be like, wise up, Alistair, don't be putting your tea in that cup. Like, because it's connected. So it doesn't matter if one side of it's fine. If the other side's broken, the whole thing's broken. 
And I think sometimes uh, all of us have this way of compartmentalizing our life and looking at our mental health, our physical health, our spiritual health, our emotional health, like they're all separate things and they're just not, they're all part of one cup. So if one part of it's broken, it affects the entire system. And really what I would say is we all need to be really careful because what happens is for all of us, I think we have a tendency to look after certain parts of that. So some of us are really great at looking after our spiritual health. But honestly, we never think about our physical health. And and that apparently is okay to us. Or we're really great at thinking about our mental health, but we would never think about our spiritual health. And, and we, as human beings, if we are meant to flourish and do well, we need to be able to look at all of those areas and make sure we're healthy across all of them. And so my advice would be to anybody is to ask yourself the really simple question, which part of my health do I focus on? And I'm really good at looking after that bit, but actually this bit over here, I've completely ignored as if it doesn't matter. Um, because getting back to a more uh, connected way of looking at the human health and wellness, I think is essential moving forward for all of us yeah brilliant thank you so we're connected we're connected physically mentally emotionally spiritually um, and we'll get to some of those in a moment but maybe you guys could give us one tip for people in regards how can we improve um people who are struggling how can they help themselves physically physically uh well they say you have to burn up your adrenaline because that's what's causing all the press. So they said, you know, go for a walk if you're out out with social isolation or uh, do something that actually makes you sweat. I got a, as I said, I I trained all the time, but I got a a bike in the house, a static bike. And uh, they said 20 minutes. Now at the beginning, 20 minutes was like a a marathon, but I did two minutes and then I built it up. But it was just that doing something to try to burn the adrenaline up and that then brought a bit of a peace in this anxiety side of it for me anyway. Yeah, I would say um, you have to think about your natural physical responses. So whenever you're struggling with fear or anxiety, you're so exhausted with the battle of it that you tend to all kinds of comfort things and your natural response can be to, you know, lift the, the sugary, the sugariest caffeine filled stuff or to just lie down in a dark room when you need to physically exercise or you need to put some healthy things in your body so I would just say you need to rewire you need to work really hard at thinking what's the one thing I can do physically for myself or my physical well-being and let's start with that and work on it until it becomes a natural response so that when I'm anxious I don't I don't run to the dark room now when I'm anxious I run to the exercise bike or whatever that is in Davies case and you're reprogramming your response so that even when you're afraid and anxious and your body's all over the place and your mind's all over the place your natural response is a good one I think you need to retrain some of those physical responses just brilliant thanks guys and um, I've also heard it said that uh, for many of us the biggest battle that we'll ever face is the one between the years and it's the battle of the mind Charlotte and um, you mentioned the battle of the thought life and your thought life within your talk and you talked about worst case scenario thinking. How can we win the battle of the mind? Yeah, I think one of the most helpful phrases I ever heard around this was don't believe everything you think. And so I think sometimes when a thought comes into our mind, we just assume it's truth. And what we need to learn how to do is to interrogate our own thoughts to figure out if they're true or not and to cross examine them and ask ourselves are they true especially with thoughts that are very robust have been in our lives a long time or very over generalized so for example if you walk into a room and presume everybody hates you and that's just the way you always feel i bet you they think i'm a tube i bet you they hate me and that has become the rhetoric in your mind then you have to stop and ask yourself how likely is it that every single human i meet hates me like that's just not even likely and what happens is that has become like a stronghold thought and then once you have a stronghold thought like that what you do is you only look at the evidence that backs up that thought so i will see the person who's rolled their eyes at me even if it wasn't even at me and that is that's evidence that backs up the thought say everybody does hate me but i will have missed the person who smiled at me when i walked in or the person who wanted to sit beside me and so you need to start interrogating your thoughts and not just looking for the evidence that backs that thought up but be brave enough to look at the evidence that doesn't back the thought up you know the contradictory evidence so i think interrogating your thoughts is a huge way forward to you winning the battlefield of your mind because truth is central to getting rid of fear and anxiety for me Brilliant. So good. Thank you. Davey, 
Have you yeah. any tips for people uh, that will help them win this battle of the mind? These, this sounds absolutely nuts, okay? But one of the things that always worked for me was, uh, you, you call it uh, stinking thinking. You know, like Charlotte says, there you go off from one and you, you think the stupidest things in the world. One of the things that worked for me, and that may not work for everybody, and it sounds absolutely crazy, I used to think of a green elephant, right? And when I thought of a green elephant in my head, and that sounds nuts, it sort of deflected my attention from what I was thinking. It was like, you can look at something that's absolutely ludicrous, think about it, and it sort of deflected your attention away. I know it's not some great spiritual greatness there, but it worked for me. My motto in it all, too, my, my motto always was, I'm getting out of this. Whatever it takes, I'm getting out of this. And that was a part of the, for me, then the thinking, because it's, it is the thinking that really pulls you down. And, and you, a, a thought just starts and it spirals and spirals and spirals. And it just wipes you out in the end. So if you can deflect it in whatever way, and for me, that was, that was the way I did it. So it worked for me. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. So there's lots of people from different backgrounds, I'm sure, watching uh, along with us tonight. And some will have a firm faith in Jesus. Some might be struggling. And there may be some who don't have a faith in Jesus at all. In fact, they're just watching because they're really reaching to just get some sort of help because of what they're walking through. So wherever people are coming from, here's my question to both of you. We're under the assumption we've been talking that Christians aren't, uh, that, that, that this stuff hits Christians as much as it hits anybody else. Yeah. That we walk through mental illness, fear, anxiety, all of that stuff. Even Christians get that too and walk through that and journey through that. But here's my question. What difference does God make in the midst of the journey? for each one of you and go for Davey and then Charlotte. I would say everything, to be honest. God makes all the difference in the world to me, for me personally. I actually struggle to know how people survive without God. I mean, life's hard, hard enough, but the fact that you can go to someone who isn't going to judge you, isn't going to question you, isn't going to sort of, it's like Charlotte said, you know, when Edwin came and he listened, and he maybe didn't have the answers. God has the answers, but but someone to go to and to hide in, you know, that's for me. My faith in God really pulled me through. I I don't actually think I'd be here today if I hadn't that faith in God. If I didn't have that that idea that you know God's got this, no matter what the circumstances are. And that was a truth that I could see in the Word of God, wrote in the Word of God in black and white, that God's for me, that God will never leave me or forsake me, that God will pull me through. So even in the midst when I was holding on to my fingernails, I knew that God still had my life because I'd given my life to him. He was my father and he loved me. And for me, God was, I would have to say, he was everything. I got to know God probably more in, the, in my anxiety and my depression than I've ever got before. Because it was just him and me. My wife, God love her, she, she did everything for me. My family were brilliant. People were good to me. But I, I felt, even in the midst of all that, it was just me and God. And God pulled me through major league. And I would encourage anyone just to turn to God. And he'll pull you through. Yeah, I would echo everything Davy said. Um, I think there's a verse in the Bible, in 1 John 4, 18, that says, um, perfect love casts out fear. And that's really interesting to me because I have a lot of people in my life who love me, a lot of really good humans who love me. But good as they are, they're not perfect. And they're, because there's fractures in the humans that love us, then there's still fear in that love. So, for example, whenever I first got married, I'm married to this incredible man, like he's an absolute legend, the best of the best. But see, those first couple of years of marriage, I just spent them so afraid that he would leave me. Because sometimes people do, you know? because there's betrayal in that kind of love sometimes, there's selfishness in love. And even, at, even if person, people are really good, eventually they die and they leave you and the love is fractured. And so even human love, there's so much capacity for loss in it that you end up afraid anyway. It's just not stable enough. And I think that a lot of fear is built in in this fear of loss. Like I'm afraid of, what if I lose my business? What if I lose my reputation? What if I lose my finances? What if I lose my best friend? What if I lose, what if I lose? And fear is in, in this built in sense of loss. And so we're given this idea that perfect love is the antidote. And the only one who can give that to us is God because he is completely perfect. And his love 
is completely perfect. There's no loss in it. Like he will never betray us. He will never leave us. He will never abandon us. He will never die. You know, our relationship with him is, will never be fractured or broken at any stage. And no matter what I lose, I can lose everything in life. Like I can lose my home. I can lose my family. I can lose my reputation. I can lose my, my, my wealth. I can lose my health. I can lose everything. I can even lose my very life as we all will someday and walk through the doorway of death. But even when I walk through the doorway of death, I walk into love because his love is at the other side of death. It's even there, you know, there's nowhere, there's no place I can go where I am separated from the love of God. And that is so stabilizing to know that no matter what happens to me in life, <laughs> like he's still going to love me, like absolutely adore the life out of me. And that, that pushes fear, you know, out, out of my life constantly. That's, that's the rock that I run back to is like, Charlotte, even if the worst happens today, you go to bed tonight, completely, totally, utterly loved by a God who's going nowhere. And that's enough for me to, to come through fear. So I honestly, like, if, I just feel like if people could understand the deep love that God has for them in the middle of their fear and in the middle of their anxiety, it would be so healing, like so super healing. So I hope that people discover that who haven't yet. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Um, and time has really uh, been our enemy today. We're almost at a close. But what I would love us to do is just take a, a few extra moments and... Um, I'm just so aware that there are people who will be watching this right now who are going through exactly the things that you've talked about. There's fear, there's, there's, there's anxiety, there's the struggle and there's the journey. And again, as we say, there's people of faith, there are people who are struggling in their faith and there are people who are journeying towards faith and wondering what it's all about. But what we would love to do right now is to have Davy and Charlotte pray. And they're gonna pray for those of you who maybe are on that journey of struggling and some of you will be totally familiar with this. You'll know to close your eyes and just know the presence of Jesus. And some of you, this is totally new to you. So why don't you worry you are as the guys pray? Why don't you open your heart towards God? Why don't you maybe for the first time, just open your heart up and just say, God, if you're there, can you come and be that person that's in the room with me and help me? I'm going to ask the guys to pray. And I would encourage you to close your eyes, not because there's anything spiritual about that, but it helps us to focus on what we're really saying. So go for it, guys. Uh, maybe, David, you'll pray first, and then Charlotte, would you pray? Thank you, guys. Amen. Lord, we just come near me. We thank you that you do love us, that you care about us, that you, you love people. And Lord, you, you so love the world that you gave your son to die for them. And Lord, your love is immeasurable. And Lord, I pray for people who are going through, Lord, even some of the things we've talked to tonight, and they don't know where to turn. Lord, I pray that you will just reach down, Lord, and, and, and touch their hearts and that they'll find you. And Lord, your love will set them free from their fear and their anxieties. Pray, Lord, that people will realize that you're a God that's not against things, but you're a God that's for things. You're for people. And Lord, help people in, in, their, in their bedrooms, in their living rooms, wherever they are watching this, to just reach out and to just, Lord, just to touch them, touch their hearts, touch their lives, Lord, and show yourself to them. Reveal yourself to them, Lord, and set them free, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, Lord, we thank you that you're not far away. And even when we don't realize it, like you're so close. And I thank you that everybody watching this right now, you're like right beside them. You're not a million miles away. And so I pray for a, like a revelation of that in their lives, that right now, wherever they're sitting, they would just be so aware that you are with them. And I pray that you would still their troubled soul that you would speak peace to troubled spirits. I pray that, Father, you would restore sleep to those who have struggled to sleep, that you would restore um, clarity to those who've been really confused. I pray, Father, that you would help people to be brave enough to ask for help when they need it. And I pray you would send the right people along to help them. But most of all, Father, I pray they would know your deep, deep love. I pray that it would just surround them, that they would be so aware in the next uh, days and weeks of the deep, deep love of Father God for them. And I pray that that love would just revolutionize and change their lives. Um, and I pray, Father, that in a few years' time, when they look back, they'll be so amazed at what you've done, like so amazed at how far you've brought them and the person that you have developed in them. Father, we leave them in your hands and in your care because we know that you really care about them in your name.
Amen. 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 Thank you, Davey and Charlotte. We really appreciate your time and your thoughts and your experience just speaking into this. Um, and thank you for everybody who's joined with us. And we'd encourage you, if this has blessed you, to share this on your Facebook page, to um, connect with somebody. Maybe you know someone who's going through a bit of a time and this would be really helpful for them. So please do uh, feel free to share it and get it wide and help as many people as we possibly can. Also, just that little announcement that we made earlier that Words of Hope is just taking a slight change and really this tonight has been a launch pad into what we're going to do from the 8th of June, uh, Monday the 8th of June for the next four Mondays within June. We're gonna be looking at Words of Hope and they're gonna be mental health conversations. And our first one is gonna be on stress. And many people know that stress is kind of the door that uh, is, is, is the opening for many other things that, that happen within our lives. So we're gonna be looking at that. If you have questions that you would like put to the panel um, on that particular night, please do get in touch with us. Uh, email to info at elamchurchireland.com or get in touch over Facebook or one of our social media platforms and uh, we'll do our best. Do that by Wednesday and we'll do our best to put those and as many of those questions to the panel. Um, also then, if you have any questions uh, in regards of faith or in regards of what we've talked about tonight, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Again, info at elamchurchireland.com and we will get back to you. We will respond to that. Again, there are further resources available on www.elamchurchireland.com forward slash words of hope and we would love to hear from you and connect with you but for now thanks for being part of words of hope and we'll hopefully connect again with you soon god bless <music>